Um, so today, or tonight, um, we are going to be talking about uh, Zora Neale Hurston, How It Feels to Be Colored Me. Um, and this is a really interesting essay that I think, I feel like the way it reads on the surface, like the first time you read it, is a little different than, um, I guess, the way it reads when you analyze it a little further, um, which I, I'll kind of address what I mean by that um, throughout this lecture. So I hope you guys are all doing okay um, and that these lectures remain helpful. Um, sorry that they keep being at random times. Um, I have like really slow internet at home and basically it takes like all of my internet to upload a YouTube video for like three hours, which means I can't do any of my other work, all of which is on the computer now because all my grading is on Turnitin. So um, just, you know, it's not that interesting, but that's, that's what's going on over here. Um, so uh, Zora Neale Hurston, um, we obviously talked about her a little bit last time with the story Sweat. She um, was actually like an anthropologist. She studied under, um, what's his name, Franz Boas, I think is his name. Yeah, he's, he's really famous. Um, and she studied anthropology at Barnard, where she was the only black student. Um, later, she was under the patronage of a rich white woman named Charlotte Mason, who was also the patron of Langston Hughes for a time. Um, and patronage is just like this woman would give her money and basically support her so that she could make art, um, which this woman, I guess, deemed important. But unfortunately, um, Charlotte Mason was a really toxic patron and she forbade Hurston from publishing anything without her permission. Um, she made Hurston beg for things as small as a pair of shoes. And in 1932, she tried to claim ownership over all of the material Hurston had like collected over um, the course of their relationship. And at that point, Hurston um, severed the relationship. And I believe after that, um, Charlotte Mason lost interest in the Harlem Renaissance. Um, Langston Hughes um, has criticized Zora Neale Hurston um, for being what he saw as a white audience's idea of the perfect representation of the black race. Um, and so that's kind of the, that's kind of what we're going to be breaking down in this essay. Um, so Hurston actually ended most of her association with the Harlem Renaissance after like an argument that she had with Langston Hughes. Um, so the two of them had like very different ideas about what it meant to be a black writer in America at the time. Um, and it's an interesting criticism for Langston Hughes to make because the Harlem Renaissance had a very um, wide readership of white people and in some ways was almost like aimed toward white audiences. Um, so although these authors were like challenging white stereotypes and white ideas of like how black people should be and how black people should make art, um, they were challenging those ideas by addressing white people. So the Harlem Renaissance itself had a lot of its audience uh, was white Americans. So for Hughes to make that criticism, like it's it's an, it could be potentially considered an apt criticism. Um, Hurston, I think it's still talked about today as, you know, this is still like a thing that people discuss about her. Um, and I think this essay in particular. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's still kind of like a weird thing for him to say, I guess, because he was part of a movement that was doing in many ways like the exact same thing. Um, so yeah. Um, so how it feels to be colored me is pretty explicitly addressed to a white audience, right? Because who, you know, because if you're, if you're black, you like, you know what it feels like, right? You're not going to be like asking Zora Neale Hurston, like, oh, how does it feel to be not white, you know? Um, and so the title of the essay addresses this like implicit question that white audiences expect and expected at the time black authors to answer somehow in their work. Um, and she published this in a journal that was white um, 
called uh, World Tomorrow. Um, it was a journal whose, pub whose editors were all white, but they were sympathetic to Harlem Renaissance writers, and they did publish people associated with that movement. Um, so the, from the very first sentence, um, she addresses these uh, sort of attitudes that she assumes white audiences have, right? So she says, I am colored, but I offer nothing in the way of extenuating circumstances except the fact that I am the only Negro in the United States whose grandfather on my mother's side was not an Indian chief. That's page 357 is where this starts also. Um, so right away she's sort of addressing this idea that like her audience thinks being black is something that is an extenuated, like needs extenuating circumstances, something that she has to make excuses for somehow. Um, and she says, like, no, I, I am proud of who I am, right? Like, that's, I'm a, I'm a black woman. Like, I don't have extenuating circumstances. And she also addresses this sort of, um, like, Indian chief thing um, where people would say, like, oh, like, I'm not only, you know, like, of African ancestry, right? I also have, like, American Indian ancestry. Oh, my neighbor's being really loud. Sorry. Um, so, um, so right away she refuses to apologize for her um, identity, which is important. And um, according, so I, I used this article that I'll link in the um, in the the YouTube description uh, for a lot of this lecture. And according to this author, um, uh, I think Barbara Johnson is her name, uh, she says, the acquisition of color is a loss of identity for Zora Neale Hurston. So she says when she leaves Eatonville, she is no longer little Zora. Um, and she instead... Um, was now a little colored girl. This is on page 358. So when we think about what her life was like in Eatonville, um, where she grew up, that was an all-black town, a very successful all-black town. So although she was like aware that white people existed, she wasn't growing up in a society that was defined by this racist power dynamic between black and white, right? Like it was a black town, so she didn't have to necessarily contend with that all the time. There's also this really interesting moment um, in the middle of page 358 where she talks about how she would um, like dance for the white people. So during this period, white people differed from colored to me only in that they rode through town and never lived there. They liked to hear me speak pieces and sing and wanted to see me dance the parsmila and gave me generously of their small silver for doing these things, which seemed strange to me for I wanted to do them so much that I needed bribing, bribing to stop. Only they didn't know it. The colored people gave no dimes. They deplored any joyful tendencies in me, but I was their Zora nonetheless. I belonged to them, to the nearby hotels, to the county, everybody's Zora. Um, so before she leaves this town, she plays this role in which white people passing through the town would like give her money to perform for them. Um, and this kind of addresses implicitly this like messed up relationship between white audiences and Harlem Renaissance writers, right? Where like white audiences would read work written by black people, but it had to sort of like fulfill certain expectations. Um, and Hurston is also addressing here the fact that white people would pay her, right? So this is almost like a subtle jab at like the journal she's publishing in, right? Um, so she is willing to perform or write or whatever for white audiences because like she wants money at the end of the day. Um, so it's kind of a, um, I think it's a very like telling anecdote um, that she uses to, to make this analogy to her status as a black writer in the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and this was published in 1928, by the way. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so when she leaves Eatonville, she's subjected to the prejudices of the outside world. Um, and so that's, I mean, that makes sense, right? Like once you're 
once you leave a town where there is like no racism and you start experiencing racism like that is going to make her feel like her race you know she's going to start feeling that as a really essential category of her identity um so um she says on page 359, I do not always feel colored. Even now I achieve the unconscious Zora of Eatonville before the Hegira, which um, is the flight of Muhammad from Mecca in 622 CE, according to our footnote. I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. So this is like a very famous line from this essay. This is also a line in which she is clearly addressing her white audience and saying, you know, perhaps she feels most colored even um, when thrown against the sharp white background of the other authors who probably would have been mostly white, who would have been published in this all white, or in this white journal, right? And when we say it's a white journal, like all of the editors were white and most of who they published would have been white as well. So this essay itself and the fact that she had to write it probably made her feel um, like as she says here, most color, because she is being thrown against a sharp white background. Um, so, yeah. Uh, she also says, you know, she addresses her experience at Barnard here, where she was the only black student, so that would be another situation in which she would feel different. Her race would, you know, be something that needed to be addressed, um, because it was, like, the sight of her difference from other students. And then we have this really interesting um, anecdote where she is at a jazz club, the New World Cabaret, um, which is a Harlem nightclub popular in the 1920s. And so she, oh no, okay, I have low battery, but hopefully it will last. Um, so she is appealing here to a very popular stereotype at the time of her writing, which was that, like, um, this, this idea that white people had that black Americans could revert at any time to, like, primitive Africans. Um, and it's problematic and weird. And, um, it's something that Hurston later um, rejected in later writing. So it's fairly likely that she put this in the essay um, to appeal to her audience, right? Because she's not saying like, I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. And then here's this situation in which I don't feel that way, right? Here's a situation in which I feel like I am in the dominant group. Instead, she's going even further and showing even further how she feels like her, um, I guess like her African ancestry when she's in this situation. So we have like, uh, this orchestra grows rambunctious, page 359, rears on its hind legs and attacks the tonal veil with primitive fury. So even using the word primitive, rending it, <clears throat> rending it, clawing it until it breaks through to the jungle beyond. I follow those heathen follow them exultingly. I dance wildly inside myself. I yell within, I whoop, I shake my asagai, uh, which is a spear, above my head. I hurl it true to the mark. Yow, I am in the jungle and living in the jungle way. Um, so I can see why perhaps Langston Hughes would have some qualms with the way that she wrote um, about her race for white audiences because this essentially encourages this idea that white people at the time would have had of like, oh, you know, like, I mean, essentially that black people are like inherently like more primitive and white people are inherently more civilized because you'll notice that this white person she's with um, is sitting motionless in his seat, smoking calmly, and then says, good music they have here, he remarks, drumming the table with his fingertips. Um, and so she's kind of playing to this idea of type, this idea that like there is this fundamental difference um, between, uh, I guess, how she and this white guy can experience jazz. Um, yeah. So um, in a later essay, Hurston writes, 
um, let me find this for you. Okay. So this comes again from this article that um, I'll cite in the description. Um, in 1950, 22 years after How It Feels to Be Colored Me, Hurston again takes up this jungle stereotype, this time to disavow it. Um, the contrast between the two essays is significant. So, okay, this is what Zora Neale Hurston wrote in this 1950 essay, and the essay is titled What White Publishers Won't Print, which is kind of apt, right, because this was published by white publishers, and then in this essay she's saying, here's what white people won't print. So Hurston says, quote, this insistence on defeat in a story where upper-class Negroes are portrayed perhaps says something from the subconscious of the majority. Involved in Western culture, the hero or heroine or both must appear frustrated and go down to defeat somehow. Our literature reeks with it. It is the same as saying you can translate Virgil and fumble with the differential calculus, but can you really comprehend it? Can you cope with our subtleties? That brings us to the folklore of reversion to type. This curious doctrine has such wide acceptance that it is tragic. One has only to examine the huge literature on it to be convinced. No matter how high we, and by we she means black people, no matter how high we may seem to climb, put us under strain and we revert to type, that is, to the bush. Under a superficial layer of Western culture, the jungle drums th throb in our veins. Um, so in this essay, uh, what white publishers won't print, she is addressing a black audience, and she has a very different take on this idea of the, um, what she calls, uh, or what is known as the type of the, quote, exotic primitive. So, that, yeah, so what there is to say on that. Um, later in the essay, she writes, um, or actually this isn't actually later in the essay, it's on the same page, a little earlier, sorry, I'm kind of jumping around here. Um, she says um, that she doesn't want to be pitied for her blackness, right? So she says, um, someone is always at my elbow, page 358, to remind me that I am the granddaughter of slaves. It fails to register depression with me. <clears throat> Later she says, slavery is the price I paid for civilization. So again, kind of like prefacing this exotic primitive ideology, I guess. And the choice was not with me. Um, it is a bully adventure and worth all that I have paid through my ancestors for it. No one on earth ever had a greater chance for glory. The world to be won and nothing to be lost. It is thrilling to think, to know that for any act of mine, I shall get twice as much praise or twice as much blame. It is quite exciting to hold the center of the national stage with the spectators not knowing whether to laugh or to weep. Um, so she is addressing the implicit expectations of her white audience here, which are that as a black woman, she needs pity or requires pity from her audience because her situation is worse, right? Um, and so in doing this, she's really saying to her white audience, like, you don't have it better than me, which I think is interesting because I think there's a level on which um, white audiences kind of like fetishized on um, the suffering that was often depicted in art made by black people at the time and that also kind of still happens today. Um, so she refuses to let her audience pity her and she says it is quite exciting to hold the center of the national stage, again, um, denying the assumption of her audience that it would be that it would be worse to be black somehow, right? So she's saying like, it is better to be black than it is to be white. And she even says right after that, the position of my white neighbor is much more difficult. Um, and I mean, this is this is interesting, right? Like it is it is really essential to keep in mind as you read this that like her audience is white people in 1928, um, and she refuses to let them feel that they are somehow superior to her um, because being black is so awful. And that's not to say that there weren't obviously lots of like horrible things happening to black people at this time in America. Like systemic racism is and was real. Um, 
but Hurston doesn't want to address that in this essay. Um, and I think that's sort of a rhetorical choice that she's making, so it's kind of interesting. Um, okay. All right, so I kind of did that out of order. Sorry. Oh, well. Um, so at the end, um, <clears throat> she affirms herself, saying, um, at certain times, I have no race. I am me. When I set my hat on at a certain angle and saunter down 7th Avenue, Harlem City, feeling as snooty as the lions in front of the 42nd Street Library, for instance, <laughs> um, New York Public Library. <laughs> Love that library. So far as my feelings are concerned, Peggy Hopkins joys on the bull mish with her gorgeous raiment, stately carriage, knees knocking together in a most aristocratic manner, has nothing on me. The cosmic Zora emerges. I belong to no race nor time. I am the eternal feminine with its string of beads. So there she's kind of affirming not just her race, or really not her race, but herself as an individual. Like, beyond the category of race. Um, so in, so you'll notice that throughout this essay, she answers the question, this implied question asked of her by a white audience, what does it feel like to be colored you? She answers that in a lot of different ways. So here she says, sometimes I don't even feel that way, right? Like, just like you, I don't constantly think about my race. Um, sometimes she feels like the eternal feminine with its string of beads. She also says, um, I have no separate feeling about being an American citizen and colored, which I think is important um, because you can link that back to the fact that the Harlem Renaissance um, was like the quintessential movement that separated American modernism from European modernism, um, and also what we talked about in the last lecture, what I talked about in the last lecture, um, where W.E.B. Du Bois said that, um, that African Americans had the most American experience of anyone in this country and that their art was therefore the most quintessentially American. Um, she then says, this is, this is a great, this is also a really famous line um, in this essay, sometimes I feel discriminated against but it does not make me angry. It merely astonishes me. How can any deny themselves the pleasure of my company? It's beyond me. Um, <laughs> and so again, this is funny. It's a rhetorical move where she refuses to say, um, she really is refusing throughout this essay to kind of give in to the pressure of white audiences to display her suffering for them. You know, like she's saying, yeah, I feel discriminated against, but like, whatever, like that's, you know, that's their problem. How can anyone deny themselves the pleasure of my company? Um, and then she ends with this um, this sort of analogy of these like paper bags that are all in different colors, right? And like every person is a paper bag, um, and they also have their in insides, um, which are like not determined by how they look on the outside, which is like a really classic sort of and honestly kind of simplistic, like, just thing that people will say about, like, oh, don't be racist, like, we're all the same on the inside, you know, like, um, and, I mean, not, like, simplistic, like, it's wrong, it's just, like, it's, you know, it's a, it's a very, like, often used analogy, I guess, right, like, the outside doesn't matter, it's what is on the inside that matters, and on the inside, we're all the same, and that's basically what she's saying. Um, This also um, was probably a reference to the brown paper bag test, which I don't know if you have heard of that, but this is um, a form of racial discrimination practiced by white America in the 20th century in which whites would compare an African-American person's skin tone to the color of a brown paper bag. I'm reading this from Wikipedia. Um, so it was used to determine whether people could have certain privileges or not, um, and has also been used by um, African American social institutions, or probably was used by them um, as well. So 
the brown paper bag test was essentially just like colorism at its finest. Um, and yeah, so it's it's very possible that this is sort of like a, an implicit allusion to that as well. Um, okay, so ending this essay, she erases difference. She says, I am no different than you, you are no different than me. Um, and the final, I think the final line of this is really telling, right? So the final line, the final statement of this essay is who knows? And who knows is kind of her answer to the, to the question that is asked of her at the beginning or the question that she is addressing, right? How does it feel to be colored me? Who knows, right? Um, so she resists um, her audience's desire for a fixed answer, right? So she imagines that her white audience, and she's, she's right, that her white audience would have wanted one fixed answer of what it is or what it means to be black in America. Like, you know, tell us what that is. And Hurston refuses to give them that easy answer. So what she seems to be saying throughout this essay is there is no one exact answer of what it means to be black. Um, it depends who's asking. It depends why they're asking. It depends on the situation. So identity is fluid um, and context dependent. And she tells us this throughout the essay, right? Like she feels differently depending on the situation. And ultimately, um, she cannot give her audience a neat and tidy answer of what it means to be um, a black woman in America. Okay. Um, so I hope that was a useful lecture. Um, and I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, taking care of yourselves and just continue to let me know if you need anything. Um, I'm, you know, I'm around. Answer my email. Um, yeah, and I hope you guys are all doing well. Bye.